y decirles de todo corazón que estoy profundamente dolido. I am deeply sorry. This is an apology decades in the making from Pope Francis in front of thousands in Musquachis, Alberta. Through an interpreter, it's his first attempt at atonement for atrocities at Canada's institutions of assimilation known as residential schools. I am sorry. I ask forgiveness. I ask forgiveness, in particular, for the ways in which many members of the church and of religious communities cooperated, not least through their indifference, in projects of cultural destruction and forced assimilation promoted by the governments of that time, which culminated in the system of residential schools. Good evening. Global National is in Edmonton tonight for the Pope's visit to Canada. He delivered his historic apology about an hour south of here in Musquachis. It was home to one of Canada's largest residential schools. The Pope says he feels shame for what Indigenous people suffered and calls the abuse a deplorable evil committed by so many Christians. What our Christian faith tells us is that this was a disastrous error incompatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is painful to think of how the firm soil of values, language, and culture that made up the authentic identity of your peoples was eroded, and that you have continued to pay the price for this. While some people feel his apology is meaningless, the crowd in Musquachis responded with cheers. Heather Urex West was there where the Pope visited the Sacred Heart Church and spoke to parishioners. As a day school survivor and the daughter, granddaughter and sister to many family members who attended residential school, Gilda Suse spent most of her life outside the Catholic faith. Growing up, I was, I was uh, taught that the church was a bad place because of the residential school. But after the death of her son, Suse found solace in this church. Our Lady of Seven Sorrows is a place of both Catholic and Indigenous spirituality. Prayers are spoken in Cree. In the stained glass, Jesus is pictured as an Indigenous man. And it was here, in the first stop of his penitential pilgrimage, that Pope Francis met privately with Suse and other elders from Muscochi. I really truly believe in my heart, you know, that healing will happen. Near the site of the Ermanskin Residential School, an institution that Indigenous children were forced to attend for more than 80 years, the Pope prayed for those children who never made it home. Children who have become represented on this journey by a pair of moccasins, first delivered to the Pope in Rome by Marianne de Walker Peltier. In Muscochi, the Holy Father gave those moccasins back. It was not a gift to him, it, it was a symbolic presentation to represent the children that were taken to me well, like I felt that uh, uh, he did hear me he did listen to my presentation and uh, it made me feel that he's a very humble person and very kind but it was these words of sorrow and apology that so many elders residential school survivors and their family members had come to hear Mary Spence and her family traveled 18 hours from northern Manitoba. It meant a lot to me. We need reconciliation, forgiveness. For forgiveness to be as one family in God, as how we were greeted. Sisters, star small boy and Andrea Rain came on behalf of their dad. This has been a long time coming and so for us to be here on, on his behalf and we're just hoping that healing would come and he would have that um, forgiveness for him to move on and for our family to move on. Of course, the Pope's apology was for those watching from across Canada as well. For those children whose names appear on this long list that was walked through the venue, all of them children who never returned home. And for this child too, too young to fully understand the painful past today, but who, in healing, might grow up in a world where reconciliation becomes reality. Heather, the Pope addressed the parish at Sacred Heart a short time ago and delivered another apology. What's the mood like there? 
Oh, me too. This has been a day of very high highs, of joy, and also very low lows. It's been a very painful day for, for some as well. Uh, after the, the Pope left the parish, he took some uh, an impromptu little walkabout, and he went to the fence and actually took some time to greet some of the people that had gathered there to see him. Uh, a man came out of, of the service and spoke to me. He was beaming. He was a residential school survivor from Northwest Territories. He said that he had a chance to drum for the Pope and he had received a blessing and received a, a rosary. So, you know, he, he just felt that the day was, was, uh, was very joyful and he was very happy to hear the apology. Meanwhile, though, while he was inside, uh, inside the church, there was another woman outside beyond the fence that I spoke with and she was also from Muskochi and, and she was weeping. She, was, she told me that she was in, in a lot of pain. She was experiencing trauma and throughout the day we've seen people in, in wearing blue, that they've been at all the events, they've been trained to offer mental health supports to uh, the people that are, are experiencing trauma. This is very triggering, this is very difficult for some and so, you know, talking to her and seeing her receive support was, was a really stark reminder that this is a very emotional time and, and there are so many reactions happening. It's something that the Pope spoke about inside the Sacred Heart Church as well. He reminded the church here and the church really across the country that uh, they have to continue to do work to support uh, Indigenous people as they continue to work through uh, so much of their pain. In Roma, in Rome, after I listened to your stories, I stated that any truly effective process of healing requires concrete actions. So I am pleased to see that in this parish, where people of different communities of the First Nations, of the Métis and the Inuit come together with non-Indigenous people from the local area and many of our immigrant brothers and sisters, this effort has already begun. So the Pope has completed his first day of his tour and he will continue his tour here in Edmonton tomorrow. Me too. Thanks, Heather. The Pope says an apology is only a first step and an important process will be to conduct a serious investigation into the facts to help survivors heal. <laughs> Following the apology, Wilton Littlechild, honorary chief of the Ermanskin Cree Nation, welcomed the head of the Catholic Church by placing a war bonnet on the Pope. The gift was among several given to the Pope during today's historic apology, but many say it wouldn't have happened without the revealing of at least 200 unmarked burials near the former Kamloops Indian Residential School in B.C. Nearly 15 months ago, that site became what is referred to as ground zero of this international reckoning around Indigenous history. Tonight, we hear how some survivors of that institution feel about today's events. And a warning, some viewers may find the details of this story distressing. This drumming is medicine, Everett Tom tells us, standing in front of the institution that first and forever scarred him with relentless trauma while he was only a boy. So much abuse has happened in here. The pain and the hurt, you know, as a seven-year-old, I was on top of these stairs and I wanted to throw myself off and... Uh, what pulled me back, I don't know, you know, just choosing to live. And to thrive. After addiction controlled his life for years into adulthood, he became a father and community pillar, now eight and a half years sober and healing. He chooses to dress himself in hope. I've tossed all my other t-shirts away and I just wear orange. While holding on to symbols of the horrors he experienced. This here's the shirt I wore home from the residential school and I was about seven years old. By then, his mother had become an alcoholic. She later apologized to her children who were ripped away from her. I'd hold my mom's apology very, very, very high, whereas I won't accept an apology from the church because they stole not only my childhood, but so many childhoods. Each individual, each suffer in a, in a, in a way. Diane Morgan says she spent 10 years here. We didn't have love. We didn't, nobody showed, you know, that they cared for us. It was something that was distant. 
We didn't have that. So we had each other to hang on to, to hold. She's now in Edmonton for the papal visit. Before she left to Kamloops to Schwetmik, she told us she wants meaningful action and criminal accountability for the abuses she and so many others suffered. Is it just going to be lip service for our people to hear? Him being here in Canada now, I'm hoping that there is some justice done besides the apology. My hope was for him to come here to the Kamloops to Schwetmik knowing that this here is ground zero. The work that I'm doing and the messages that I'm carrying is so important in this here time of history. Everett Tom has since adopted six children from out of the Indigenous child welfare system, which many now see as a modern day institutional extension of the residential school framework. Stopping that cycle for them, and it it also helps heal us as well as and we learn a lot from them. Six is a big number, you know, for us and to have such a busy household. <laughs> a lot of laughter and a lot of love. The kind, he says, was once stolen from him. And a reminder that if you or someone you know who is a residential school survivor are looking for help, you can call the Residential School Survivors and Family Crisis Line anytime. The number is one 800 721-0066. We'll have more coverage on the Pope's historic visit later in the newscast. First, there is other news to get to tonight. Emergency Preparedness Minister Bill Blair and RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky are denying interfering in the police investigation into the Nova Scotia mass shooting. They were key witnesses at a special hearing convened by MPs seeking the facts in the wake of allegations federal officials pressured police to push forward a new firearms ban. Ross Lord reports. More than two years after the living nightmare that left 22 people murdered, the Mass Casualty Commission's public inquiry is hearing more admissions from the RCMP. That was communicated and how that A was A key understood. player in the Mounties' response, Superintendent Darren Campbell admits 911 information was not shared precisely. Information suggesting the gunman was driving a fully marked replica RCMP car. You can call that an error um, in their assessment of it. And why, even when it became clear the killer had escaped their incomplete containment effort, the Mounties never initiated an emergency alert to the public. That wasn't a tool that we were aware of that we had in our toolbox. But political admissions are slow in coming. Campbell's handwritten notes allege RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky leaned on investigators to publicly reveal the gunman's weapons and that Lucky was pressuring to help justify the government's upcoming gun control legislation. At a House of Commons committee in Ottawa whose hearing was timed to Campbell's Nova Scotia testimony, Commissioner Lucky made a partial admission. Was there pressure for information from the federal government about this incident? Yes. This wasn't surprising as we were dealing with the biggest mass shooting incident in our country. But she insists there was no political interference, a position shared by then Public Safety Minister Bill Blair. At no point did I direct the RCMP in any operational matter, including on public communications. Other witnesses, like this former RCMP communications director, reinforce some of the allegations. She was irritated that she had briefed the minister that we would be proactively discussing the weapons based on my earlier update. And the organization's former commanding officer in Nova Scotia was more definitive. So you heard the commissioner say she promised the minister and the prime minister's office. Yes. Did the commissioner Lucky directly tie that to the uh, forthcoming um, firearm policy from the Liberal government? Yes, she did. So she said the pressure was from the minister and the prime minister's office that she had promised them that that information would be released and the pressure was a result of it being tied to the forthcoming gun policy from the Liberal government. Is that correct? That's correct. The Nova Scotia testimony from Superintendent Campbell continues Tuesday. In coming weeks, the Parliamentary Committee will also hear from more RCMP and government witnesses. Ross Lord, Global News. A series of shootings in a Vancouver suburb have left three people dead, including the gunman. It happened in Langley, B.C. this morning. Police killed the gunman, who was known to them. Investigators say they're still not sure if the victims were targeted because they're homeless. In the hot seat over that disastrous outage. Coming up, the president of Rogers gets pushed for answers.
We are coming to you from Edmonton tonight as Pope Francis's six-day trip to meet with Indigenous communities in Canada has gotten underway. More on the Pope in a moment, but we turn now to Ottawa, where Rogers executives were grilled while testifying in front of a parliamentary committee to explain the network outage that cut off millions of Canadians earlier this month. Shalima Maharaj reports on the questions raised over the blackout that left customers unable to communicate with their phones, use internet services, or even dial 911. It's been just over two weeks since the outage that left millions of Canadians out of touch and disconnected. Appearing before the Standing Parliamentary Committee, Canada's Innovation Minister isn't pulling any punches about who's responsible. It should not be to the minister to chase the CEO of a major telco in Canada when something like that happened. It should rather be the other way around. Testifying before committee, Francois-Philippe Champagne told MPs the government is in solution mode to prevent the next large-scale telecom failure. When I speak to them, they listen. That's bottom line. They don't uh, have to follow, though. Well, listen, they do. Uh, they do. Trust me, they do. Businesses across the country were handcuffed, having to turn customers away when the Interact payment systems went down. We will set a higher standard by physically separating our wireless and internet networks and create an always-on network. To be frank, this added layer of protection will be expensive. We estimate it will cost at least a quarter of a billion dollars. And calls for increased competition in the Canadian telecom space keep getting louder in the wake of July 8th's outage. So isn't the concentration of customers in one particular co company a challenge to resilience in and of itself? They have alternative and they have choice. Wait, wait, so, so, wait, wait, so wait you, you think Canadians have alternative and choice in this marketplace? Very much so. Um, and you're saying it, that with a straight face? The minister and the government definitely need to own a significant component of what's happening here because ultimately the companies will do what the government sets in terms of expectation. According to security expert Christian Loiprecht, they haven't set the bar high. I think we need real rules similar to what we have in the airline sector about what happens when there are these kind of outages. I think that we need greater transparency and disclosure around these issues. In the meantime, Rogers and its rivals have another 45 days left to meet a government deadline to produce solutions should another outage occur. Shalima Maharaj, Global News, Ottawa. Ahead, Ukraine's rush to reboot vital food shipments as Russia's aggression continues. We are broadcasting from Edmonton tonight for Pope Francis's meetings with Indigenous communities. We'll have more on the Pope's visit to Indigenous land in a moment. But first, the latest out of Ukraine. Kyiv says it hopes to once again be exporting grain this week, even after Russian attacks on the port city of Odessa over the weekend. The attacks happened Saturday, just hours after Moscow and Kyiv signed agreements with the UN and Turkey to restart grain exports and not attack merchant ships moving grain to market through the Black Sea. Russia initially denied being involved, but now says it was targeting Ukrainian military infrastructure in the area. Kyiv says it expects the first shipments of grain to be exported from its Black Sea ports within a few days. Moscow, meanwhile, charged 92 captured members of the Ukrainian armed forces today for what it calls alleged crimes against humanity. Russia's investigative committee proposed an international tribunal backed by Syria, Iran and Bolivia oversee their trial, all traditional allies of Moscow. Amnesty International has called the move a brazen disregard for fair trial rights and humanitarian law. The sights and sounds of healing. Next, another look at today's raw emotions in Musquachis. We're at the Indigenous Peoples Experience exhibit in Fort Edmonton Park. We'll be right back. You're looking at the Indigenous Peoples Experience in Fort Edmonton Park, an exhibit exploring the diverse lives, cultures and histories of the Edmonton region's First Nations and Métis people. It was made possible thanks to the contributions of dozens of Indigenous elders, community members and historians sharing their artifacts, memories and timeless teachings. It's where we've been reporting from tonight on Canada's latest chapter of Truth and Reconciliation. Today's events are just the beginning of Pope Francis's week-long trip that will see him travel to Canada's north and Quebec. 
Here are some of the moments from an emotional first day in Alberta. are very sacred to us. War bonnets represent leadership, leadership of our nation. That is one of so many powerful, raw moments today as an Indigenous woman went up to the microphone to sing what started as a rendition of O Canada in Cree and evolved into calls for action to the Pope, including revoking the doctrine of discovery. That is Global National for this Monday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. We'll leave you tonight with more from Musquachis. Our coverage of Pope Francis's journey of truth and reconciliation with Indigenous communities will continue throughout the week. Good night. Yeah, hey, 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 hey